Welcome to the Petrichor Marching Arts Podcast, where we talk all things marching arts. My name is Bryson Teal. I'm a songwriter, composer, and mixing engineer, teaching and designing for drum corps, marching bands, and indoor percussion groups on the East Coast, as well as my mainstay school, Newtown High School in Connecticut. I'm sitting down with performers, educators, and creators to discuss perspectives on the activity, to see where it's at now, and where it's headed in the future. On this month's episode, I'm here with snare drummer, teacher, Phil Andrews, and we go through his philosophies on teaching, as well as his perspectives on patience, whether you be a student, teacher, or person. All right, we're back. In case you missed it, there is a third episode out there. It's on my YouTube channel. It's a Skype call um, with Ricky Grasso and Kevin Thompson. There's a video up on my YouTube channel. If you search Bryson Teal, B-R-Y-S-O-N-T-E-E-L, you'll find that there. Um, also, I hope everyone out there is doing, doing okay. I know this is some crazy stuff happening. I've been trying to collect my life and not be in shambles <laughs> all the time, which I think is pretty universal for most people out there. So um, hopefully this rain in the background is a little bit helpful. It actually is really nice having that as the background while I'm editing this episode. Um, but today I have here a conversation I had in late November or so holiday season with Phil Andrews. He actually stopped by my home studio in Connecticut and I've had this one in the vault since then, <laughs> but now's the time. Um, he has a lot of great info, especially when it comes to patience, which is really what we revolved around here. And we might've skated around to a fault <laughs> at times. Um, but a lot of interesting stuff to consider here that maybe we don't always think about whether you're your teacher a student who's a beginner intermediate advanced whatever um i think you'll find this really helpful there's a lot to take away from this one and i hope you all enjoy it. all right sweet so i'm here with phil andrews hey how's it going so i think we the last time we marched together was 2013 right yeah that was ages ago <laughs> seventh regiment yeah so i we haven't really had a ton of contact since then but you've still been kind of going through the marching arts we kind of both went our uh, just ways um do you want to let the people know kind of what you've done since you know we last saw each other even your yeah. your background when you were younger too absolutely i guess we should start at the very beginning yeah <laughs> um so i've been drumming for a while i think the time i started to take it serious was around 10 my first exposure mm -hmm. to like the marching arts was through the fife and drum stuff, like all the tricorner hats and stuff, and yeah. specifically like a Christmas parade. Like I remember like going to this big jam session, a lot of drums, a lot of loud noises. I had no idea what's going on. It just sounds like World War II. It's like the musters. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like <laughs> two years old at yeah. the time, mind you. So I'm just like, I don't know what this is, but I like the loud noise. It's really cool. Right. We had, like, Christmas pictures the next day or something. The next day, next week. I don't remember the actual timeline. Mm. It was definitely nearby. It was Christmas time. And my mom's got me and my baby brother at the time just, like, in these little sweaters with, like, some knitted fish on them. <laughs> and, like, it was a... It was like, you know what I'm talking about? Like the really itchy, scratchy yeah, wool. Like for sure. that's what it was like. And I was just miserable. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hot in the sears. Like the heat from the lighting is just like searing down on me. I'm super uncomfortable. Yeah. And my mom just like left because I was like not having it. I was like not smiling. I didn't want to take the pictures. So mm. be it. You know what I mean? So she comes back with this tin drum got like plastic heads and like yeah, really yeah. baby drumsticks like kind of like the vicks for kids but like the the rope drum version of those right which is not the same thing at all but <laughs> she puts them in front of me and instantly my mood changes like it's so different than what i was before i started smiling i actually mm -hmm. started beating the crap out of the thing but like, yeah it got it made me happy you know what i mean like that's well, that's where this all really started. Like, that really right. cute story. I don't really tell a lot of people that. Mm -hmm. But that's how it all started. And throughout the years, I started meeting, like, all these different educators in the rope drum activity. And mm -hmm. 
I, they worked my way through, I went through my first Pipe and Drum Corps, Warehouse Point, under Jim Clark, who's in Middletown. Yeah. And eventually they folded. I went to Colonel John Chester, entered Brendan Mason. Mm-hmm. So Brendan Mason, I learned a couple of years afterwards was at 7th. And then I was interested because I knew he was an in if I wanted it. So he's kind of the reason why I went down that path because I knew he was going down that road. Yeah. Um. Wow, this is a monologue. No, anyway. it's fine. That's what we're here for. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's 2012, and I just like started researching drum corps like it was nobody's business. Like old yeah. school, like Vanguard 88, 89, Phantom 88. Mm-hmm. Like Spartacus, Mad World, do you name it? I was looking it up. I was trying to drum it. Like <laughs> basic sure. strokes, good old Vanguard. Like that's the stuff I was after. And one of the drum lines that I had been watching a lot was the Cavaliers in 2011. Yeah. Like you know the infamous Omaha video. Like, oh yeah. <laughs> just the snare lines, just cranking it all out, and it's just super good middle of July. So, without knowing who the dude is in the center of that center line, I see him at the December camp of my first ever drum corps audition. I'm like, what? What is going on here? <laughs> no way. Yeah, so <laughs> that's how I met Dan Shocker for the first time. He told me to yeah. turn my wrist less for triple rolls, and I was like, okay. Yep. <laughs> and the rest is history. So, I marched for you guys. Well, we marched together in 2013. Yeah. I stayed there for a couple years. I stayed through 2015. I went to Crown in 2016. I aged out in 2018. I started teaching 7th again in 2019. And I picked up the Phantom Regiment gig also just a couple weeks ago. There we just go. camp last weekend. And then Cap City too? Yeah, I'm at Cap City. James Sparling and Evan Worrell kind of just like came through and were like, hey, you should teach here i was like all right let's do it <laughs> for sure yeah it was sweet um we kind of skipped the indoor realm within all that i did s- the cadets winter percussion oh right of course yeah 2015 yeah. through 2016 and they folded and then i followed travis and dana george mason from 2017 and 18 aged out of the max in 2019 yeah i have a really really long resume it's good. It's, it's, there's no problem with that, but no, man, no. it makes me feel old just talking about it. It's weird, right? It goes by so fast. It's like, especially just getting into it in high school and then it's like, you're just like out of college and it's just kind of right. what's next. Right. And now all I can do is just give back. This activity changed my life. Yeah. Like even what I experienced in drum corps was different than what I experienced in high school. I like mm-hmm. we're in Bristol right now. I went to school down the road at Bristol Central. We did one yeah. competitive band show a year, and it was yours. Something. Oh, like. was it really? Yeah, that's the that only was the time only I would show see you. we did. Okay. And we had an old, we had Ed Shank. We had an old, he was the old Boston guy that kind of just oh. ran our percussion program. Okay. So I got the training that I needed in a more traditional level, which I think set me up better to just learn how to take that run with it into the modern realm and Mm -hmm. explains a lot about my technique and some of the things that i do a little differently than other people okay which i think is really cool now i like put two and two together yeah but we never really competed we did the fall marching band we did a winter percussion ensemble that was like concert based right so i didn't really have the indoor scene until i did cwp so that's pretty cool that's that's a yeah fun difference (laughs) it's definitely not the same thing yeah (laughs) it's a higher level for sure so i guess like coming out of all of that now that you're doing a lot of teaching i mean what seems the most interesting to you just in general like are do you have an interest in writing eventually are you just really wanting to dig into you know the the philosophy of teaching and all that stuff and technique i would say it's a little bit of everything Mm -hmm. for me i want to integrate the tradition that i know that i learned i want to integrate it into what i'm teaching these kids now yeah because if you look at our activity it's evolved so much just because we found processes that are way more efficient yep (laughs) than good old long rolls and triple pair duels you know what i mean but in an effort to keep the tradition alive it's important that we get the new wave of incredible snare drummers mm. and quad drummers and bass drummers. We get them all the same training with the original 26. That's a, one of my big tar- 
talking points is like the past is going to fuel the future the right way yeah we just have to find how like that's one of my things another thing is like taking the technique that i knew like i am a big traditionalist i guess you could say in terms of just like how i move the sticks especially from where you come from too right yeah like we prep for every role we play we hang it together we communicate (laughs) through not only the notes but through the space yep and it takes an understanding of like how the sticks move and all that stuff to just get that understanding to the kids definitely and i think it's cool because there's i definitely see a lot of potential not just in the design stuff and have that's going to change um, but also in the teaching and the approach to drums. Right. I mean, even once all those people came around saying like, like Murray Gussick and John Mapes and uh, Mike Jackson in the 90s and stuff leading to the 2000s started just be like, all right, we could just play this more like drum set, stuff like that. And like just different ideas happening. Right. And um, I love that. You know what I mean? I think that I derive a lot of my teaching from the drum set training I had. Yeah. Because I did that for a little bit just to like get a feel for it. And I really enjoy that perspective. I enjoy finding the pocket. I like that that's a, a term that we use as drummers today. Because mm-hmm. our job is to keep time and only keep time and understand it in a way that f- makes us feel good yeah. while playing a technique that is like the exact opposite. It's like, how can you let the music affect you and also not let the technique suffer? Right. You know what I mean? Do you feel like there's an approach that you still want to go for that like and keeps all the space stuff in mind i I think there's a lot of things that align when just going back to like the drum set based ideas and all that stuff especially like john likes to talk about um do you think there's like another approach to that within the same realm that you're thinking more about as opposed to strictly just like west coast well i mean i think that we got to be an amalgamation of everything yeah you know what i mean i think that we got to borrow from everything that we know one of the things that a great friend of ours omi taught me when I was 18, you're all from different backgrounds, right? Mm-hmm. You had to take the knowledge from everybody that you know. You got to put that together, and that's your style. Yeah. So I can only like ingrain my style amongst like nine people at a time. Right. And even <laughs> that's going to be varied just by like the sheer variable of like all the people that have taught them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think as far as my approach is concerned, I just talk about wrist turn and making sure that like every note speaks the same way every note is articulate in the same fashion yeah if it all comes from the same place it will feel the same it will be more consistent you will hear the tendencies and yeah it takes a lot of patience to get right but also that's a challenge it's like we're teaching kids how to do this from scratch sometimes yep how long does it actually take and how patient are you willing to be I've had my fair share of those moments where it's like, am I doing the right thing? Am I waiting too long? Like I, I try to yeah. do my best to evaluate <laughs> that too, because it's one of those things where like, if you are too cutthroat, you lose a kid's interest. Yep. You ruin a kid's day Agreed. and maybe he or she failed the math test and it's like she or he can't handle this. You know what I yeah. mean? So it's a really really thin line but the more i'm around it the easier it is to feel out i guess something that i've noticed recently just teaching at newtown um same thing with spartans and stuff too is that you know the more that the technique becomes clear to me and how like exactly all the mechanics work the patience thing seems a little bit easier to come by just because i know like okay like once they get this then there's this and like super straight ahead is all you got to do check it out we'll get a bunch of reps on it and then they kind of take that next step um but i I found that more so this past year um because i started teaching um before i aged out in like 2015 in high school and i just like didn't know anything just like coming from drum corps just trying to do it i've just been trying to critique myself as much as possible over the past few years and just get like a different lesson every time and i think that was what i got out of this past season so we lost um, a really great snare drummer. Um, he's, he was going off to college, so we had to fill a new spot with a bass drummer. I think she had played, like, Glock, I think a year before. Oh, my. <laughs> in our winter percussion program and just kind of stepped into bass drum at one point. Um, 
But we looked at that and it was just like, okay. Like, we're, we're going to have to take our time. It's like trying to build someone up to be on those other kids level two as fast as possible. We ended up building like kind of like a spreadsheet of how to approach the technique from the ground up so that it would make the most sense in the fastest way possible. Because I know for me, like learning, there was like years that I spent trying to figure out basic things that I just wasn't entirely taught correctly at times, or I was also interpreting them, interpreting them incorrectly. Um, and that was also a super fun part of this past season that we never really super thought out um, how to take from some scratch to the next level as fast as possible, but still keeping in mind how long that takes. Right. Like how it's going to take the whole season. Right. It's always about the marathon, never the sprint. Yeah. And sometimes we do prioritize the sprint. We just call it a show instead. I think we were talking about this before yeah. we started recording. We put the kids in a situation where they're not comfortable with what they're doing right away. Right. We don't give them the time it takes to succeed. You don't tell a piano player after three months he's a pro. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're doing to these kids. It's like we're putting them out there to like compete without true understanding. Yep. So another basis of my teaching that I've been trying to figure out is like, how do I find the perfect way to build things up from scratch? Mm -hmm. What are the tendencies that come from like the all the possible wrongs? How do I teach that first? Because yeah. I one of the things I've been experimenting with experimenting with lately is can we find right by finding every wrong possible yeah like we talk about being relaxed and being loose all the time behind the drum mm -hmm. so how tense can you be right like almost that what's the word i'm looking for reverse psychology type of approach to it that's kind of what i'm looking at okay I think the more we can find every extreme, the easier we'll be able to understand what's perfectly in the middle. Yeah. And when we get that right, good things start to happen. Do you and find it's easier to kind of like figure that stuff out at the high school level, like with Centerville and stuff, as opposed to um, like higher up drum corps and like... Absolutely. Because you have to deal with so many more tendencies when you're yeah. teaching younger players. Because you can tell them to do something and then they'll overdo it. And you're like, okay, do this. And then they underdo it. And it's like, okay, enough I was in the middle. And yeah. yeah, I'm doing a lot of different things, which are kind of super unorthodox, which makes me want to do them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I like taking pride in doing things in a different way. Like, I come from a different background, literally. And I enjoy that approach. So one of the things I've been doing lately is like I have my kids turn their wrists to like full extension yeah. and I keep the bead height the same and I make them use all their arm. Okay. So it literally just like takes the muscle recruitment away from the wrist and like puts it on the arm so that they can find like every version of like what's wrong. Oh God, don't do this ever. Yep. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> it can literally hurt you yeah. if you do it. So that's been helping. I've been experiment experimenting with like a couple different kinds of like, like grips. I do mm. a lot of Swiss grip work with my match grip kids. Oh, okay. Because yeah. we tend to talk about like making sure the fingertips are always like intact, but so much to a point that like the hand, those hands are always closed. So Swiss grip naturally opens up the back of the hand just because you're using a closed fist to turn a stick twice. Yeah. Like for double strokes, for example. Okay. And I use that to get kids to stop using so much finger. Right. Like. <laughs> Like, oh, no, the, like really, the crazy pump in the gas stuff. Right. Like because like if we're, if we're resorting to the smallest possible muscle group, there's more work that we're missing out on. Yeah. Because we're just copping out early. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have a lot of different approaches to that. That one's Ma good though. Yeah. And like, especially like being taught by James, I think one of the funniest things that like me and uh, my buddy Kevin took from him was how much he uses the word literally. Which is honestly he great. He literally uses that all the time. And I love it because it's, it's it makes everything more cl like clear cut as long as you take it literally. <laughs> yeah, which is funny. Um, We're, I'm trying so hard not to say literally right now. Yeah. Well, and I love it because it's just ingrained into my brain now because of how easy it is. Yeah, because it's also like the other end of the visual side. Also, like when you're explaining it, trying to explain it as 
clearly, not literally, as possible. Um, like, something like if someone's just, like, using their fingers too much. It's like, okay, this next rep, just literally, like, close your fingers more. Um, or maybe define that so it's more clear in that way. Right. Just so you can feel like what it's to do the opposite. Or, like, do another, like, thing you were explaining to do that same, um... Yeah. Get that same outcome. Find the wrong to find the right better. Yeah, yeah. That, I think that one's always stuck with me, even from, like, from that summer, because it, it just... It's one of those little details that I think people miss when they're trying to explain something to somebody. They'll speak in generalities, and especially I tend to speak, like, too philosophically at times and just kind of lose myself in it. Um, but, like, thinking about how he was teaching kind of reined in <laughs> some of those thoughts so it could just be as black and white as possible. Um, as it should be. Yeah. Exactly. You should have a clear understanding of what you are expected to do mm -hmm. in a given environment and experience and skill set you know what i mean yeah when we allow ambiguity into the door that's when things start to go haywire yep so as much as we can talk about these things as possible as like a staff i think that's better for us all i like that you talk about the spreadsheet that you have with newtown that live document so to speak oh yeah it's from dan <laughs> yeah but the thing is like that works because you're still learning and evolving as an educator. You yeah. have to. Yep. There's no other explanation as to why we can continue to stay where we are. Yeah. Because without the selflessness to let go of like your ways and find a new right, you're never going to find what it truly should be. Yeah. And I don't know. We're all in pursuit of perfection here, and we're all trying to find that in different ways. And I think we're... All, it's funny looking at like place to place to place and how we all know how to drum the same way and like turn the wrists and lead with the bead and whatnot. And mm -hmm. it looks different just because of the verbiage we use. Yeah. And even like, it's, it's cool. It's funny watching like certain people's hands and watching the group that they teach. And it's, it's like people are like mimicking your body language too. De definitely from demonstrating. Absolutely. But it's, it's, that's one of the cool parts, how it just gets individualized place to place based on the staff. All right. Good old play it like this. Yep. <laughs> Jumping off of that, I remember, I think Gridbook did a video with John Mapes. I can't remember if we talked about this before, but he was, he made a point, like, if you're a new educator, like, one of the most important things you should do is just, like, pretty much just check yourself. And, like, realize you have more control than you think you do over all these situations. So I think, especially once people get started, they, like, just blame things on the kids, and they're just like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe next year there's practice more and figure it out, and, like, so a lot of that's, that's just not it. yeah it's just all all in the educators too um which is definitely something i didn't understand till probably like a few years into teaching and then i saw that john mates video and i was like yep that's totally right especially hearing it from him was cool too yeah that dude knows what he's doing yeah for sure i would love to pick his brain because i've never had a chance to like meet the guy mm -hmm. i haven't watched the video i would yeah. love to just check it out you know what i mean like i want to see where his head's at and it's and cool, just, too, like, him coming from the background of not doing a lot of drum corps, and he just, like, wanted to teach and, like, find an outlet to write, and then he just kind of got in there and just kept doing it. <laughs> but, right. yeah, like, he was patient, like you're talking about. You have to be to get where he is. Yeah. You also have to be super self-evaluative, which is exactly what we're talking about mm -hmm. right now, but I reiterated it because it's important. It's so hard to do that when yeah. you're in front of kids because... You think you're there because you're better than them, but really you're just further along in the development. Yeah. Everybody's at a different point in their growth. You know what I mean? Um, I don't remember the speech off the top of my head. Like I said, mm -hmm. I was at fa I was at a Phantom Cat Phantom Camp last weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Words. Story of my life. Yeah. And <laughs> Rob Ferguson just went on a tangent, and I loved it because mm -hmm. first off. He is a walking TED talk. Like yeah. I really enjoy working with him and he's spot on about everything that he says. Mm -hmm. It's great. One of the things that I noticed from him is he went on a tangent about just giving it everything that you have. Like think about like 10 gallon tanks or like five gallons, yeah. 200 gallons, you name it. If you're giving me all the gallons right now, that's the right approach. That also shows where people are in their development. Right. Because it's like, oh, I know 30 skills. Oh, I know 15 skills. I know 38 skills. Like, you see where people are at. Super cool. Yeah. And 
based on said information that you can derive from just like looking at a person's hands, you know how to help them. Yeah. But only if you've done your research and only if you're solvable enough to be like, hey, this is what works for me. It'll work for you. Right. You just have to be patient and work with it and trust me on this. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing that I'm trying to think about. Just like, how can I get kids to trust me more? And I mean, I yeah. have a hard time opening up to people. Same. You know this. I was very, <laughs> like, I'm a very introverted person. I yeah. said maybe five words all summer. And it was on a day in Michigan when we were getting our, can't say that on podcast, but <laughs> not safe for work. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, we were just getting our butts beat and eyes got angry. That's really the only time I really spoke is when, like, I had, like, a grievance. Yeah. Almost to a fault. But, I don't know. Having patience, like, pays off. A yeah. Lot. You know what I mean? Like, you're able to... This was not the tangent I was going on, but I'll go out this way anyway. That's fine. We, <laughs> we talked about this. Patience is such an important skill. I learned that the hard way because I taught Blackstone Millville for two years. Yeah. Right? And... I will, I'll be the first to admit, I did a lot of things wrong. Mm -hmm. I didn't show up with the patience to just make the kids what they deserve to be. I didn't give the kids the skills. Yeah. I could say the same things over and over again, but like, if I don't know how to get through to them one way, I had to find another. Yeah. Your job as an educator is to find every possible way to explain the concept so that it makes sense in six different ways mm-hmm. so to speak that's a ballpark word yeah but yeah with that intact like you have to find analogy after analogy after analogy it takes a lot of work i've noticed and mm-hmm. some of it i've just accumulated over the years just by being around it and being around Shaq. I, honestly like he finds new ways to describe the same concept yeah and he makes it as simple as possible which makes it as effective as possible. Mm. And that's all I need. I need a simple reason why that makes solid sense that is conducive to everything else that's been told to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you know what? I think it's cool. Like you brought up, like I'm a huge introvert as well. It brings about like a certain quality that when you kind of take all those like evaluations that you might be thinking about or feeling and just kind of finding the way to actually speak them out loud. There's like a certain like conceptual idea to that. And I feel like it brews information in a certain way. Um, whereas some people, they kind of are really articulate and in processing information as they go. Um, as opposed to kind of like mulling it over, like just in, just like by yourself and like taking in the information around you, even while you're teaching to apply that and stuff like that. It's hard to describe for me. But I feel like there's I a certain where you're kind of, at. yeah, like it's a very, for me that takes a lot of rehearsal, like yeah. articulating what you know so well. Mm-hmm. That shows me that I truly understood something for myself. Yeah, and it stays true to the form. It's like we're trying to just put the puzzle piece together, and like this piece could go here, but it's probably better off here. When that piece doesn't belong here yet, yeah, it needs this first. Like, that's what we're doing as educators is we're mm-hmm. like trying to piece together the big, the big puzzle that is marching percussion for ourselves. Yeah, it's so unique and so cool and. Literally, you can make breakthroughs at any point in time. Yep. And it makes so much sense to you. And then, I don't know, I've experienced this recently. Like, I've hit, like, the jackpot eureka moments, and I've just applied it to the kids. Yep. And they get it. (laughs) And I get it. Right. And we just improve and we break past the threshold. Boom. One extra quarter chop for everybody. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, That's a really rewarding feeling. That's also... Like I said, it's a lot of work to get to that point, yeah. to articulate what you know. And I think I think that self-evaluation is just kind of what eventually gets you there. I mean, just like, if you keep going, you're just patient with what you're doing, and the whole time, you're just continually trying to find new ways to not just, like, help the kids, but also better yourself and better how you can approach everything. I think that's, like, a missing link from a lot of programs and people that they just haven't quite understood yet that could 
change the entire way that they do everything. Right. And I'm going to question the system here. Is this because we throw them into the fire too early? Is it because mm -hmm. we don't give them the help that they need? Right. Like, are we sitting down with them? Are we helping them through this subject that is all expansive? Yeah. Do they understand the math? Do they understand the music? Do they understand the way the literature works in this in mm -hmm. this sense? Do we give them enough time to do that? I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the I think that the reason why some programs are so successful is because obviously like they have marching percussion year rounds. Like indoor is mm -hmm. huge for the development of the activity. And I love that. But I think that the toms are the key. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the flubs of the world. It's like literally, it's my first year using those too. Yeah, it's Love like the, they're great. The thing is, like, it gives you a chance to just like be in it without all of the added levels of exposure. Yeah, without any other worry, but to just do your job in survival mode, so that you can do it again, and it's gonna feel so much better. Yes, <laughs> you can do it in a better way. I've watched a timeline of five people go from not being able to move their feet together to playing like 16th note roles. With oh yeah. Incre like incredible and impressive quality. And it's because they've had the time to develop and the patience from the staff to just be like, this is going to be bad for a long time. Yeah. And that's okay. We're not all the way through our development yet. Right. And that's fine. So we added flubs for this fall season for the first time. It's the first time I've actually done flubs anywhere. And I, I sometimes thought the kids probably thought I was sarcastic about them, especially the new incoming like uh, eighth graders and freshmen because I was so excited about it. Because once I really kind of locked down like what flubs were doing, like what the opportunity you had to do or what, the opportunity that you had to help people improve as fast as possible in the best way possible it's just like tossing these kids on the toms getting the marching getting the experience just in general kind of like you're saying right and like playing check patterns like listening how to play with the group you know like especially like doing exercise like paradiddles playing the actual check for paradiddles for like a fall and winter season like that's pretty sick <laughs> to me it's so that's a skill that i never had when i was in high yeah. school because i was never taught right like, I was self-taught by the 26 and the 40 rudiments. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I did a lot of that on my own. I had a lot of help, but never so much that it broke down the skills to the backbone. Right. And it made me understand it's something way more encompassing than that. Yeah. One of my things that I realize now is, like, eight on a hand is home base. Mm -hmm. And first, second, third, downstroke, full stroke, upstroke. Yes. You know what I mean? We know that we have our bases covered by those four things. We just need to find them. Mm -hmm. I could expand on that, but I don't think we want to go into that. No, I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. That's exactly what it should be. <laughs> and as, as soon as we can make the kids aware of that and giving them the skills that are not over their heads, we layer it in one advanced skill at a time. Yeah. It becomes way easier for them. I guess to just go on that topic for a little bit. This past season, we actually, we took out, because we had a super long Legato's accent tap thing. It was actually, it was too long. <laughs> so we ended up going the opposite direction. We had um, like a three camps based thing. And there was like a Legato section at the end. Um, but that also allowed us to be like, okay, oh, we like improved our buzzes. We did like the buzzes during the three camps. We did a little tap pyramid in there. Um, so that stuff got better. And then we got to the end of the season and we're like, we messed up <laughs> in the self-evaluation thing. It's just like, all right, that stuff's cool, but we, we need to do the legatos more. I mean, working on, especially just unifying upstrokes, kind of, same thing with downstrokes. We were getting downstrokes in with a lot of like our checks and tags for our paradiddles exercise and stuff. Um, same thing with like triplet timing. It was just triplet form. Right. But we weren't like hashing out, you know, breaking down the accents, tap different partials of the eighth notes, you know, getting through bucks and everything. Um, and it definitely showed, which sucks. Um, we, we went through our old sequence at the end of the year just a few times and you could hear everyone's approach to sound quality improving. Um, the approach to just kind of like, or if you want to, like the slow up, fast down thing that people talk about. Or just getting a powerful velocity stroke and the downstroke. So I think, especially for me, like I already knew it was important, but there was like that extra moment of clarity was just like, all right, I get it. <laughs> that only comes when you break the skills down the right way. Yeah. 
And like I said, that takes patience. That's huge. I guess really that's the only thing I can talk about is patience. That's a big thing that I learned mm -hmm. in Center Rolls. Like, I wanted to, I want, look, I want everything to be good right away. Yeah. <laughs> because my standard for no matter who it is, before I started teaching was, oh, these kids are world class. They know what I'm doing. Yeah. They know what I'm about. They're going to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not the case. No. <laughs> like, it took me being in like a band program that's like, oh, even at the highest level, it's still high school band. I have to do something that takes me and these kids to the next level. And that's when I started to go a little bit more in depth with just like how I thought. Mm -hmm. And how I could simplify it. It hit me in like September when I could talk about those things and just be like, okay, let's do this advanced rudiment today. It's these skills compounded together. Yeah. And when those kids got it, they just ran with it. Mm -hmm. And all that took was just the patience to be like, hey, I'm going to teach you something and it's not going to be okay right away. And yeah. I'm not going to freak out about it. And you're going to be fine. And I'm just going to let you go and let you run and let you do this more. And right. the more you do it, the better you'll be at it. And the more fun this gets. Yeah. And then they're all a bunch of all stars right now. And it's such they're a. They're doing great. That's such a good thing to like another thing i've noticed is that especially like i think in that like intermediate like open class marching level people can be like super scared to change their technique because they just want to be playing well all the time and they right. don't they don't always get taught like hey like in high school like hey like your, your fingers are flying off the stick right now man i know you're trying to play clean but just like stop trying to play clean right now just get your fingers on the stick like as long as you're building the right technique you'll get to be able to play this stuff with the right sound quality, with the right approach, as opposed to like just letting things fly and never actually improving. Um, like right. especially with the flub players, it's just like the flub teaches you to do the right things yeah. in a capacity that they understand, which I love. Mm -hmm. And then we take those tendencies and they rear their ugly head again. Yeah. But if they can do it once, they can do it again. You know what I mean? Like right. they're gonna be able to make the fixes. We just have to have the patience and the trust. That's like I said, that's my big takeaway from all this stuff is how patient can I be? How can I be better? Because ultimately, if a kid doesn't understand the concept, it's my fault. If yeah. I get frustrated about it, yeah. I'm venting the wrong way, as we've said. Yeah. I guess to kind of like keep going off this stuff. Um, I mean, there's like culture to drum lines, you know, having a lot of things that add to it is just having good leadership and organization, like within band parents and stuff, within like admin of a drum corps. Um, or what have you but I guess with, with the approach and stuff and just teaching in general do you find yourself more focused it sounds like you are more focused on the actual technique rather than strictly I guess how to I mean it, they go in tandem but focusing more so on technique rather than more so on just cleaning the show music kind of thing like are you thinking always like technique implementation of the show music to improve that well, let me ask you a question. When you were prepping for the SAT, you looked in a dictionary to find the words, right? Mm hmm That's all we can do is just yep. get the kids the skills. Because if they know all the words, they're going to get a perfect score on the SAT. Right. And that's kind of the MO with me is like, how can I teach you this skill so well that you'll be able to understand this skill, synonyms of this skill, it feels like this. Yeah. It is the same thing as this. The motion is the same. Like, how can I take that and run with it? And okay. if I get the kids, like, all of these SAT words, they're going to be able to read some pretty advanced level books. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that Tim Fairbanks talks about a lot. If I could teach you all the words in the book, you'll be able to read it. Yeah. If I can't teach you all the words to the book and you can't read it, I failed you as a teacher because I didn't teach you your vocabulary words. Yes. So I think that that's another thing that's really lost on people is that there's there's a lot of missed opportunities with the actual teaching of the technique and how much that applies, like how much the exercises could apply to the show music and how it can just directly translate. So I've seen the opposite end where people, you know, they do the exercises, but it's almost like the show music, like those beats themselves are almost in a way like a priority over the technique at times. 
which is interesting because I never approached it that way, but I'd see that and it's like, am I wrong? Or <laughs> it depends on the animal. Yeah. If I'm being right. Honest. Yeah. Yeah. I think that dependent on what circuit your vehicle is driving mm -hmm. in. Yeah. It impacts how you like oil the wheels and whatnot. Right. So not to, I don't want to keep using analogies. That's not my thing, but <laughs> we have to pick and choose our battles the right way. Like you can teach a kid so many breakdowns for so many skills, but if it's yep. ever too much, they're not going to know the skills well and be able to apply them into the book. Right. So the challenge is how can I walk the fine line? How can I be effective by teaching the skills? How can I apply it to a book chunk? Mm. So yeah, that's a challenge I look forward to a lot. Because, like, you need to know these skills. You need to know the technique. Yeah. Otherwise, the music is never going to stand out the right way. You also need to know the natural tendency of the of the music and its basic components mm -hmm. to understand how the technique truly works and what it's going to want to do so that you can counteract it. And I could go back and forth. Like, it's, a, it's a, like a double spiral. You know well, what I mean? Yeah. So, so about that line, like, I guess as that kind of gets taken further, I mean, there's... Getting the technique stuff down, and there's also making sure there's, I guess, high demand still at the same time to achieve well. And I guess that, that really pops in at higher up programs, you know, not necessarily like A class all the time, but still running the, running the show so that achievement is still on their minds rather than just the technique breakdowns and all that stuff. I was going to say, I wonder how much like the idea of doing like chop out sessions or something like that it starts to instill the idea of the that this requires a lot of effort especially to do it really really well i mean we're moving and playing hard stuff and i guess sometimes i wonder like how important i think it is but how important it is to put that those kind of moments in your programs of just like all right we're gonna play triple beat we're gonna just get the chops going you know like our group we used to play too light for so long and then we started just chopping out high buzz rolls getting triple beat in there and it, you kind of see the approach change and there's a little bit more maturity going on right um and i have to think that probably i guess the amount that you do it ends up translating i guess subliminally to the rehearsal and like approach to rehearsal in terms of like individual etiquette as long as it's like set in stone like what they're supposed to do and it's made clear um, i agree one of the center bill things is buy-in it's yeah. written in 72 point font on the wall yeah. as well as <laughs> focus and accountability. Yeah. So I've taken those things. I've kind of run with them. Like, like raise your hand now, raise it higher. Yeah. The classic. Like, and now I'll do it again. Mm -hmm. Squeeze the stick as hard as you can. I can't see your veins. Yeah. <laughs> You're not red in the face. It's not enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? It takes so much self honing to give it your all. Mm -hmm. And the more you can get that out of the kids and the more calm mannered you can get that out of the kids, the yeah. better it's going to be. But until you reach that level, it's not going to be what you want it to be. And you have to keep chiseling at it. Yeah. For some people it happens right away, but for most it's like a multi-year process buy-in and willpower are big ones for me yeah because you can will yourself to do anything but only if you believe in yourself that you can yeah like the 40 percent rule i don't know how much you talk about this i don't remember what branch of the military it is mm -hmm. when you think you're fed up with something and you want to just leave it you're 40 for you're 40 percent of the way through your full amount of tolerance i've heard that i've heard that in other skill. places yeah so it's like oh i can chop out triplet rolls but i'm gonna lighten up here like mm -hmm. naturally our focus and our attention to detail and our willpower like decreases over time yeah and it takes like a true amount of like i said selflessness and like discipline and maturity to just go after every note yeah that's a really hard skill, but, and that separates the men from the boys. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much this this relates. I feel like it correlates in a way. I think you hear this from a lot of self development people, but especially in like arts and stuff, like you just constantly self critical and getting bogged down. But like at the moment, you feel like 
you, you just want to give up just like on just anything you're doing could be like write music just want to give up on music like that's the point where if you just keep going a little bit more you'll you'll have one of your major successes it's right. just like right around that corner and sometimes i feel like yeah it's just like to get you to keep going but i find that like that constant motion i think pretty much like we've been talking about can we start off with is what drives success it's like we're not going to be good right away it's that patience where if you just keep going it's like you're not going to get worse if you're just constantly trying to fix yourself find the right information right if you're not doing anything then you're not going to go anywhere but like if you if you're constantly self-evaluative and you're just pushing 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 it's like most people at that point would have stopped they would have been they would have given up already on whatever it is they're doing and then right. they look up at the famous people or the successful people or successful people and they wonder how they got there and you know everyone starts off bad it's true so. <laughs> literally you couldn't play eighth notes once yeah that's so crazy to think about right yep we were all that way and i remember i remember getting my first book in elementary school and i was like i remember sitting down on my floor in front of my tv like looking at eighth notes and like quarter notes like i didn't get like what the metronome marking meant i didn't have a metronome so i was like coming into like my first drum lessons in elementary school like <laughs> like i don't even know what i'm looking at like what Me is too. a quarter note I just knew my hands moved fast and I loved playing snare drum. Yeah. I used to go to my middle school lessons and be like, I can play this. I can sight read it. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I'm looking at as I have no idea how to practice. Yeah. You learn so much over the years. It's crazy. You don't learn how to be an effective, like, technician of your own self until you do, until you learn something from the right person. Yeah. And having the perspective to look back to, like, it feels like you're always in the same place and then you you really take a look at where you started like watch some videos or or listen to stuff take a look at stuff and you like realize the place you're at is just completely different right like being in high school and i'm like designing shows for high schools it's like i never would have saw that <laughs> or thought i could do that at any right point, you know you're constantly filled with things coming full circle in your life yeah and i've had that a lot recently Mm -hmm. I did the Macy's Great American Marching Band in high school. Yeah. And I look at that group of drummers now. I teach four of them actively. Yeah. They're my Skype students. Right. It's so crazy to see that, like, I did something. And now I'm watching my students do something. Mm -hmm. It's crazy to think that I did the whole 7th Regiment thing. And now I'm teaching there. Yeah. I'm teaching <laughs> where I literally was built from the ground up right and all for the best mm -hmm. i'm looking at these groups that i looked up to i wanted to be i look at spartacus and i'm like i wish i could be there yeah and now i get to give back on the other end i get to develop the new era of history yep it's so cool. it's crazy <laughs> it's wild you get these opportunities very rarely mm-hmm I think one of my favorite ones is this is this makes this conversation come full circle by the way yeah i used to stay up at those jam sessions when i was five or six mm -hmm. like i just came from my grandparents house literally and i saw a picture of myself in a uniform at nine years old right with like a with like a frozen grip left hand <laughs> perfectly intact yeah and it's because i spent the time around drummers when i was like five six mm -hmm. middle of the summer middle of the night just drumming around the great people and just doing what they were doing yeah monkey see monkey do as somebody like at that stage but it was the patience of those adults that kept encouraging me and now mm -hmm. i come back from all this drum course stuff i go back to the fight and drum course stuff and there's this little kid and he just starts drumming next to me one night Mm -hmm. this is about a year ago and he just tells me he loves playing snare drum and w i just let him switch drums with me because i knew i did the same thing yeah i used to want to play on the big boy drum when i was his age he came back to me again this year oh really yeah yeah, yeah. the same place that i started doing it mm -hmm. it doesn't get better than that knowing that you've come so far from such a small group of people it's insane and now you're in the center of it 
Yeah, just now you're not on the outside looking anymore. You're on the inside looking out. <laughs> and you literally are giving back the same way that was given back to you. Yeah. That's as good as it gets. That's what it's about, man. That's what it will always be about. It's always about the past setting me setting myself up for the future. Mm-hmm. Things become full circle that way. It keeps feeding itself. Right. Yeah, my big thing is for the future. I don't talk about that a lot. But we just want to set ourselves up for the best possible tomorrow we could have. Best yeah. possible next week. Best show. Best season. Like, it can be quantified in a bunch of different ways. Mm-hmm. But everything that you do today, you're doing to be better at later on. Yeah. That's how it will always be. We are always improving as individuals. And it's very important that we put attention to that. And very that's true. why I keep that near and dear to my heart. This is great. This actually worked out really well in terms of... <laughs> I guess we, we ranted on pretty long about certain stuff uh, in the same concept. But it's, it's... I think patience, just keeping things going, just looking out for that stuff is so important. It's true. And it's just that those elements, the small details that actually become so huge that people just never think about sometimes. In anything, too. Like, it, it doesn't just apply to drumming. It just applies to anything in life, more or less. Right. Um, and I guess if, there, if there's any... Other things I'd be curious to touch on um, with you would be behind all the stuff, behind all the teaching and the marching arts. Is there, is there even like other stuff other than strictly just drumming that gives you inspiration to, I don't know, just to, to find methods or anything that inspires you in terms of the type of playing or the, the look of the playing? Um, it, it's easier for me to talk about that stuff with like design um there might not even be an answer for this too it's, it's just like i wonder how much sometimes teachers take other types of music or other types of musicality and apply that to the approach i guess that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> right it takes no, like i said it takes knowing what it was to understand what it is better yeah i talk about that a lot just because like Let's take, I'm going to take a pad of flaw flaw, for example, because mm. that's the Swiss rudiment, right? Like there were people playing that in the Alps in the 1300s. Yeah. And if you look at what that skill set requires of you in like a modern day, if you break it down, like you're playing an invert motion in one hand and then you're just like opening up on, you're playing an upbeat accent or an upbeat buck pretty much on that other hand. Yeah. That naturally opens up. That naturally has a crescendo feel to it. I mean, we're trying to ram them and we don't understand like what it is supposed to be, what it's supposed to sound like. Yes. Like a paradiddle has a distinct sound. That's why we use it to Just kind of like the parts. shaping and how it applies. Right. Yeah. That's why I talk about that so much. It's like this was something for greater purpose from a musical perspective at one point. Yeah. And it's important to understand how that fits in today or mm-hmm. how that didn't fit into today or why it didn't fit into today yeah and why you should do it so that you can be better at what you're doing today so true I, a lot of people i think it was like in the in the 80s and 90s people were just kind of like treating everything like it was stick control I and mean, just in like marching arts specifically not in like um fife and drum and all, all the stuff and the swiss drumming and french drumming all that but like treating everything like oh like the paradiddle should like look and sound the same as if it was just like hand-to-hand singles and now it's like finally developed in like going back to traditional drumming uh even drumming and classical music just like the shaping of the sticking how that applies to different stuff inside of actual book um like paradiddles like you wouldn't just like play paradiddles on drum set necessarily for no reason it allows you to go somewhere and it also allows you to shape what you're actually playing in terms of like whatever whatever tune you're playing whether it's jazz or or metal or whatever but it still has a function right like there are open rudiments and closed rudiments there are rudiments that feel more flowy there are rudiments that feel very uncomfortable there are skills that feel very uncomfortable yeah and it's i think that it takes a lot of all-encompassing skills to understand that yeah but you're trying to give that to a kid that doesn't know yep <laughs> That's what we're doing. Like, as educators, like, we're taking all the accumulated knowledge that we learned as, like, music students 
and we learn is just like buffs for music history or good old one and two and three and four and you know what i mean mm -hmm. like we're trying to take all of that and make it as relatable as possible yeah it's not an arms race to do that but i don't know right I, I'm not, I don't know what to think about it. <laughs> I well I think there's, I, a, there's a lot. There's like I, play there. I don't know if you've ever had any um like other members of the band come into the drum line, like any like horn players or woodwind players. Um but I found that like those people already have half the battle figured out that most of the drummers don't in terms of like how to approach things musically. Like we have a couple um we have a saxophone player and a clarinet player. There's there's like kids that were string players. But they understand some of those like dynamic stuff or some of the dynamic stuff. Right, it's like more micro phrase shape. Yeah, like more like intuitive. Understanding like where an apex is. Yeah. Now it all goes into the training. Mm -hmm. Like, did you understand your music history? Did you do you know what an A bar phrase is? Yeah. Do you know where A and B is? Do you know what a sonnet is? You know yep. what I mean? <laughs> it's all different place to place. Mm-hmm. The more we can get that all encompassed, the better. But we're, I feel like we're not going to find that perfect approach until somebody does some serious soul searching, myself included. I don't know who's going to be able mm. to figure it out first. Yeah. Where does the phrase begin? Where does the phrase end? <laughs> How do I teach a kid to autonomously find that yeah. times 30? And that's stuff you learn in college, too. Like, you get a lot of, like, classical training on just, like, doing the... Just um, like the stick control book, like going back Good to that, just going stone. through that, and then learning how to take all that stone stuff and actually um, do different sticking and different phrasing within just super basic stuff and how that applies to like Shostakovich. Right. And it's, it's, it's like I didn't learn that stuff till college, and then that helped with going to scouts and understanding that stuff, and then just especially teaching moving forward in terms of musicality and like how to approach that specifically with a drum. Right. But yeah, just getting that early on, I guess getting the, the right process and the right verbiage to explain that. And I guess I wonder how much of that has to do with exposing kids to certain types of music and all that, too. I would definitely encourage it. I yeah. always encourage my kids to chop out to their favorite tunes. Yeah. Understand like what fits, what doesn't, mm -hmm. what you could plug in all the 30 things that that could possibly be like you could play shot at shows and yeah. flam accents and just like french flams or whatever it is you know what i mean like no matter what i'm just trying to get them to make it have, make it be fun and yeah. still educational but that's only going to be something they do and say okay to unless you're like this is why i did it yeah there's a lot of there's so many variables to this. We are trying to unpack the. <laughs> this feels, you know that you know that Ives piece. Like, what is the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like we're doing that right now. We are, <laughs> we are those flutes. Yeah, right now. <laughs> well, I guess. Well, let's. We can wrap it up at that. I was ask you just like a couple, just general questions. Um. So some super basic. Like, what do you have any um? Do you have like favorite music or like favorite type of music or like favorite group or anything or artist? Um, I really like the more ambient type of stuff. Like, okay, I dabble in and out between just like white noise focus music right now, just to That's like awesome. <laughs> be a little bit more zen. I yeah. find myself stressed out all the time. Same for no other reason other than just because I don't have time to just sit there and just be like yeah you know what i mean there's that i love oliver tank mm. oliver tank i was introduced to through the cwp thing yeah we used him as source music the all i do is dream thing is from one of the songs past present future oh okay and we use the there is a ghost no moment in that show and the source music for that is like dreams of fish and waterfalls and mm -hmm. it's like an eight-year-old tune that yeah. i can only find on youtube now right I love the ambient writers. I do too. It's so freeing and spacious and it lacks chaos because it just lacks motion. But because there is like no driving force, motion is whatever you want it to be. Yeah. That's what I like about it. I can do what I want with it. You know what's interesting about that stuff too? Because I like ambient music a lot as well. 
And I, I like how that applies to film scores and stuff. Um, because I, I, you could use the, um, have you seen the, the Joker movie? I haven't yet. Okay. So just in general, like there's, it's got a cool soundtrack, but the person who wrote that, um, she does a lot of really ambient music and it's like super dark, <laughs> super like melancholy, but it's got its own style. And it's, it's also like super just like laid back, but it has like a vibe to it. Um, cause as I, it should. I, cause I listen to ambient music in the same way just so I can like think about nothing and like try to meditate. Um, but I like how that stuff applies to um, interpreting like feeling into ambient stuff and how almost natural it feels right. um, to apply that to film scores. And it like applied to Joker because the dude's super dark. He's got like a horrible past and that like kind of copy and paste of her dark melancholy vibe like enforced this character that Joaquin Phoenix did. It's like a bit of a tangent on that, but um, true. But it kind of, it kind of like cool. that music led me to liking that, I suppose. Yeah, it's cool. I like that a lot. I always drifted to the minimalist composers. Yes, like Glass, yes. Reich. Yeah, not a fan of Cage so much because he's a little bit <laughs> he's wild. off the wall. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I really like those. Okay, those guys, those are really cool that's interesting i didn't know that that's awesome yeah i'm also I, a huge fan of that stuff yeah i used to fall asleep on the tour bus listening to the soundtrack from the hours yes dude that's I my favorite movie hours. soundtrack zimmer love zimmer <laughs> that's great i'm glad you know about that soundtrack yes. i was introduced to that by blue stars and drum corps nice. they, they played you know what they i think they played actually i can't remember if it was a tune from that but they played um I think it was a tune from the movie Houdini. Not Houdini. Maybe it was. It was like some magician-based movie that Philip Glass did the score for. Just a quick edit. They did play two tunes from the Hour soundtrack. Um, that was Morning Passages as well as Tearing Herself Away. And the movie was The Illusionist. And that led me to hearing about The Hours, I'm pretty sure. And I like, first year of college, I listened to it every single day. And I, I would, like, start playing it on piano and, like, arrange some of it for uh, marimba and stuff, too. Um, That's what I did with Glassworks. Yeah, yes, dude. Yeah, I was introduced to Glass through Einstein on the Beach. Oh, okay. When Crown did it. Mm -hmm. He used, and I think it's so cool to just play the same thing four times and it takes you to a different place. Yeah. It's like, wow, I'm in a different place than I was, and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So cool. He has the metamorphosis so, stuff, too. That stuff. I played cool one of those too. on marimba. I think it's like Metamorphosis 5, and it's not so much different from the first few, but... Yeah, and I think it's something, like, percussionists can especially appreciate sometimes. There's, like, a lot of people in every instrument that can, but we're kind of, like, thrown into that. Because it's already, like, at its most basic, just, like, something that some people might not even think is music. We're kind of, like, already set to think, like, alright, this is music. So when I, like, listen to ambient stuff, I'm like, this is definitely music. But some right. people would be like, huh? <laughs> If it doesn't, if it doesn't have good old like one five one, I'm fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> like I <laughs> want to just go somewhere. I want you to take me somewhere. Like I, I'm very lenient in my music listening process. I don't mm -hmm. need a hook, line, and sinker. Yes. If I'm not in the gym, I want to relax. Yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing quite like just being taken on a journey. You ever just listen to like I do a lot of long road trips from Ohio to Connecticut. Right. Like, just via cards for necessity mm -hmm. i use minimalist music all the time i just find myself mm -hmm. getting from place to place way quicker that's true yeah it's just kind of get i think it's because do you think that's because you're more introverted so maybe i, I think I definitely for I don't me know that's why if that takes in it, that into account maybe i spend a lot of time on my thoughts and i know that for yeah sure. i guess that's what I'm, it kind of like takes you to that space a little bit yeah i guess it depends on the type of that space but at least for me, that's kind of what it is, I think. Absolutely. As it should be. <laughs> yeah, right. To each his own, obviously, but, like, I find that we're always... We can always personify a score in our own ways. Mm -hmm. It just means something different to us. Once Upon a December is another one for me. Yeah. It's, it's another CWP thing where, like, I love some certain more rubato renditions yes. of that. I think it's some of the better work because it just means something more to me takes mm -hmm. me from place to place okay 
Like, it makes me feel something different. Yeah. As it should be. You know what I mean? Absolutely. All right. I think that was that was pretty long. That's um, a lot of talking. Um, yeah, I thought that was cool. I just like to record these conversations, especially because we're, like, both, like, younger people trying to get into this activity. Like, sometimes I wonder what it would sound like to hear, like, Murray Gussick when he, like, started stuff and, like, hear Colin McNutt. Like when you early like talk to Lee Bettis thoughts. like in like Star Star of Indiana days or something to see like what happened at that point. Yeah, I love recording myself and just like listening to myself like play, speak, talk. I'm lucky I've been surrounded by like a lot of like great outlets for that. Like yeah, you you can look at my hands from 2014 to now. Right. You can hear my thoughts from May to November, December, mm-hmm. whenever this episode comes out. Right. So. <laughs> It's so cool to just hear your primal thoughts and as you get older, watch them develop. Yeah. And I'm sure I'll, I'll probably look at this. Something I said and like, I'm sure like a few months be like, oh, <laughs> you'll <different>. learn. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, man, I, I really appreciate you uh, doing this. This is Absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.